It is time now for our Spotlight program here on this Monday morning. Each and every Monday morning, we reserve time for the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce. Mindy steps into the studios. Hi, Mindy. How are you? Good morning. How are you, friend? I'm fantastic. Want to go back in time just a little bit before we jump to today's program. Uh, business After Hours on Thursday at hy V. Another uh, huge success. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. There were so many people that came through that, that room. Um, we, I think we used all of the sushi that they had prepared in the entire building, uh, and we had to keep having more pizzas brought over. It was a really good time. Um, it was a really great way for hy to showcase all that they can do. They do a lot of things, by the way, not a fan of sushi. Also not either. Also not a fan of I sushi. really like my stuff cooked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like, I'm more of a uh, land-based protein guy. What? Yeah, so there we go. Okay. Also on Saturday was the first of four legislative forums. This one took place out on the Jefferson County Fairgrounds. Uh, from what it, talking to newsman Connor, uh, seemed like uh, a good attendance and uh, a lot of lively discussions. Yes, um, legislative forums are always, I love that, lively discussions. That'll be my new running theme for that. Um, it was really well attended. We got some good feedback. Um, the Wi-Fi wasn't great, so we couldn't live stream, but thanks to Jason um, and Fairfield Media Center, it will be loaded to the website um, today, so people can go and watch that um, if you were unable to attend. Um, and yeah, I, I love the legislative form. I learn something every time I go. Speaking of uh, Fairfield Media Center, something that we've started back up in recent weeks, uh, the recording, uh, videotaping of Chamber Talk, and you can find that. Now, is that on the Chamber site? It's on Fairfield Media Center, um, and then we share it through our social media, and then um, it will be loaded to our website. I had to do some tweaking so we could load it. And as in years past, I have the best looking back of the head <laughs> in all of broadcast history. It is your very best profile. Yes, it's, yes, it's the, <laughs> They've, uh, they have the best side of me. All right. One other quick note. Don't forget the banquet's quickly approaching. I know it's the uh, middle of April, but now is the time to reserve your seats for the banquet. You can do that by emailing the chamber, chamber at fairfieldiowa.com, or giving them the call at 472-2111. The other thing is log on to fairfieldiowa.com, and uh, that's where you will make your nominations for the nearly, is it more than two? It's nearly two dozen different categories. Yeah, I think we're there? at 18 awards. Yeah, and so then you, then you throw in the uh, Citizens of the Year awards and oh, gets yeah. up there. So uh, now's the time to do that because they'll gather all that and then uh, go through. And then on that night, uh, April 18th, I think it is. 20, but you're close. Well, I knew it had an E in it. <laughs> um, there's... Uh, <laughs> They'll be handing out all those plaques and those awards, and it takes yes. a while to, uh, to get all that together. So now's the time to make your nominations. And again, that banquet coming up on the 20th of April, now's the time to make your reservations for that as well. You've brought a guest in today, so I'll let you transition. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, Mr. Jeff Shipley. Hey, Mindy. How are you today? I'm good. So you are our local representation. Uh, correct. I'm serving uh, the new House District 87, uh, which is Fairfield, Mount Pleasant, all of Van Buren County. This will be uh, my fifth year or third term in the Iowa House, and uh, it's getting, yeah, there's a lot of business to take care of. So I want to know, how did you decide to go into politics? <laughs> um, well, that's a great question. I guess there's a lot of ways you can answer it. Um, I mean, honestly, I was always very interested in social studies and government and history and, and power, you know, what compels human beings to, to act and behave the way they do. Uh, thinking back to 2018, there was a, a need. There was a local issue that I was concerned with that wasn't getting the attention that I felt it deserved. And so I saw an opportunity and, um, and, and yeah, we got involved locally and just stayed involved over a number of years. I, and, and that's another thing I want to point out, too. You know, I got, first got involved in government, in student government at University of Iowa, um, which got me, you know, attending Iowa City City Council meetings and just sitting in those for a year straight and really just kind of being a part of the process and the Iowa caucus. So I was definitely around for a while. And then I think, you know, when you show up year after year, you kind of graduate to, to one of these positions. So that's how I'd kind of describe it. Absolutely. Perfect. I love it. Well, I I don't think I could do it. People um, take everything. They, they listen to every single word that you say, right? Well, so one of the things I did have to learn is that Whenever you're talking, you are talking to everyone, whether you realize it or not, um, which previously I had been involved in the arts and culture uh, community and I liked doing, you know, stand up comedy at Cafe Paradiso. And then <laughs> it was the opposite. I had, you know, a handful of people could be one or two or a half dozen. Uh, a couple times you had a few more people than that, but you have your kind of audience and you were speaking directly to them. And if they got the joke, then it worked. 
Um, and politics is very different from that. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve that, yes, in this position, uh, your words, your actions are uh, affecting the whole entire community. And so make sure you're always doing your best for everyone. Absolutely. And so you're not a newbie anymore. So you go no kind of know your way around. Uh, well, so it's interesting <laughs> that, yeah, so I, I am entering my, my fifth year and there's a very, very big freshman class. So I think about 30 yes. percent of the House and Senate are new people, both Republican and Democrat. And I think that's great because it brings in a lot of fresh energy and a lot of people who, you know, like I said, had been involved <clears throat> or had to win elections to be there. I'd say there are kind of two different types of legislators, those who are maybe in very safe seats that just kind of get the job and don't really get challenged versus those who are in more competitive districts and do kind of have to duke it out for a right to be there. Um, so I, I've been really, really impressed with the incredible amount of, of really great civil servants we have um, in, in the Iowa legislature this year. A lot of great people coming in and for some very important policy discussions. Uh, so I still feel like I'm at the bottom of a very big mountain um, because every year does bring new challenges and, um, you know, new problems and new things we got to and just things are changing so quick. So even just staying on top of the news cycle is becoming, um, I think, a source of mental illness for a lot of people just because how a lot of these news stories are coming and some of them are big and oftentimes they contradict or bring more questions than answers and I mean, anyway, the media is a whole nother discussion. But um, but yeah, we feel like we're hopefully getting the hang of it. Um, so thankfully this year. I did kind of graduate my responsibility, so I'm on the Public Safety Committee, I'm on the Justice Systems Appropriation Committee, and then we are helping out on government oversight, uh, which does cover basically everything. So um, that's, we have, yeah, we're working on quite a bit and we're working on refining the agenda and, and hopefully bringing home some great things for the people of Iowa and certainly our community. Well, thank you for attending the Legislative Forum this weekend, um, or bright and early on a Saturday morning. Well, uh, it was a. I, those legislative forums are very, very important for a couple of reasons. And one, just thank you for doing such a great job bringing us all out there, um, scheduling things well in advance, making clear, you know, you were communicating with our schedules, making sure it worked. Um, I really appreciate the coffee and the donuts that are available. Um, I think it is asking. I don't want to say it's asking a lot, but, you know, getting people out of bed, getting them at 730 a.m., especially if people are coming from out of town. Uh, having that little refreshment there, I think, makes things a lot more pleasant. Um, but yeah, it's and I, I we've been going back and forth on you know <laughs> seven thirty a.m. doesn't necessarily work for everyone, but I love it because it's the people who want to be a part of the discussion. They're able to get there, and and it's important because one, the legislators are hearing from the public, and then vice versa, the public's hearing from the legislators. And whatever, whatever we're talking about as a community, whatever we're talking about at the forums, um, you know, that is the conversation we're bringing back to the Capitol. And that also because it is being broadcast or, or live streamed, um, you know, it does it does affect the conversation for the whole entire community. So these forums are very, very important. I've been very thankful uh, for all the work the Chamber of Commerce does to provide those opportunities. And uh, I just look forward to keep keep working on it and, and make it better and better and better, bring more people like we had. Yeah, you know, we I think we average around, you know, 40 people, maybe 50 mm -hmm. people on a good weekend. But, um, you know, it'd be great to see more and more people involved and, and hopefully expanding the program or making it a year round or whatever we can do to just. And, it, and last I'll say, because I think this is what I've seen is that the conversation never stops. Um, you know, the issues that we talked about on Saturday, there's going to be very similar issues coming up next month. Uh, there are things we talked about last year. So it's an ongoing conversation and people do need to be a part of it. And the people that show up consistently, you know, month after month are going to be the ones that have the biggest influence on the discussion. Um, like the Farm Bureau guys, they're there every month. They yep. might not say anything, but they're there. They're paying attention. And when necessary, they'll ask a question that supports their agenda. And that's one of the reasons why they're such a powerful group, because they're always there. Absolutely. So you just recently joined the chamber. Yay. Yes, I'm very excited <laughs> for that. That is, um, uh, yeah, I think the big thing that, you know, we attended that Mosden Barnes event last year and we just had so much fun and saw all the smiling children and just the whole community threaded together. Um, and of course, all the great work you did to make that happen. So yeah, we want to be a part of this. Um, you know, and, and the chamber does offer a lot of resources in terms of just connecting to the community. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about our Chamber of Commerce membership and we're really looking forward to you know, being a part of the team and helping out however we can. So what are you working on? Give us a, a quick little update on what's going on at the House in case people were not at the Legislative Forum and what you see as 
priorities for you? Yeah, so um, education is the biggest discussion. So on Saturday, I think half the meeting at least was talk. Yes. We we're talking about um, the Governor's Student First Act, which we are expecting to vote on this this week. Um, which basically it allows the state cost per pupil, which is a portion of the larger revenue stream that school districts rely on. Basically, it opens up, and uh, that state cost per pupil would follow a pupil. Uh, to a education savings account, which could be redeemed at a for tuition at a accredited non-public school. Um, so that is a significant reform. It is a different way of doing things. Um, Iowa is not necessarily the first one to do this, but I think um, one of the things the governor did is she, basically she makes this program available to everyone after three years. And then um, she does use the full state cost per pupil amount, which is $7,500 roughly and then that's going to increase every year with this with the state supplemental appropriation um, so previous proposals you know were tailored towards lower income kids or tailored to kids with special needs um, or used a less amount um, but so she really went with a bold proposal so education i, I think again um you know these things sound big but i think realistically this might affect maybe five or six percent of the pupils in the state of iowa when uh when it's all said and done so there's also going to be other conversations relating to curriculum relating to teacher licensure uh we do have a, a shortage of educators um you know finding great quality people who are professional who can really give their life and devote it to teaching children um, we have a shortage of those people so we're taking a look at the teacher prep programs and uh you know the education colleges and and what can we do to uh basically place educators where they need to be. And if we need to have some sort of student loan forgiveness program or expand upon the program we already have, um, are there other bottlenecks that are preventing um, teachers from getting licensed? Can they earn their licensing credential while they're student teaching or get more credit for those hours when they're substitute teaching? Um, are there going to be you know, other people with professional agree, degrees uh, that have demonstrated competency or professionalism? Are we going to provide another shortcut for them to get a, a teacher's license? Um, so the licensure discussion and the Board of Education Examiners, which kind of oversees that, I know there is going to be some reform on that. And then the curriculum, and I guess what they're calling into the realm of parents' rights. So one of the issues that have come up both nationwide and in Iowa are basically, are there circumstances where it would be appropriate school policy to not inform a parent about something affecting their kid? Um, and just to be frank, I don't want to beat around the bush. It's usually around these topics of gender identity. Um, and a lot of parents are very concerned and there have been school districts. And again, this is what might be driving, um, the school choice discussion or the governor's student first act is because I know in the Linmar school district, but there's a few others as well. Um, parents are really desperate, um, because certain things have made them uncomfortable and kind of fractured the trust, if you will. And I think that's just generally something we're seeing across all of society, um, you know, trusting, trust really is something that binds us all together. And if we're not able to trust each other or we don't really feel like we're on the same page for whatever reason, it causes a lot of tension and friction. And we've been having a lot of that um, for at least the last year or so. So we're trying to find ways to iron that out and give release valves for, for that friction to dissipate. Perfect. I love it. I'm glad that made sense. I, I wish I would have come with more prepared no, talking points. But you're fine. Yeah. I will, and I think that I think that. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research. I've been reading bills every day, um, so that oh I can dear. stay up to date. I know oh, it's wow. so ridiculous. I'm a little bit of a political junkie. I don't ever want to be one. I just really like it. Um, but I think that there's a lot of good things happening, and I think there's a lot of things happening that people don't realize. So if I were the average person and I needed to contact you or I needed to find out about a bill. Where would we direct them? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so my phone number, my personal cell is area code 319-432-3108. Uh, feel free to shoot me a text message or an email. Um, our emails are online. Um, usually text message or email is the quickest. Um, something about these bills, certainly at this point in the legislative session, I, I approach everything as kind of a rough draft. Um, so there is one controversial bill out there that affects the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And uh, I think a lot of people pointed out some errors with that. The goal was to provide one kind of uniform standard across the state that people could use to qualify for state assistance. And the first draft um, left a lot to be desired. Uh, so we've been hearing a lot of feedback on that. And I was like, hey, thank you for letting us know. Um, we're going to bring this back to the drawing board and, and we'll see 
um, you know, how we can fix it. So, um, yeah, definitely reach out, text message anytime. There's a lot of good news sites. So I know the Iowa City Capital Dispatch has been a popular one. Um, I know the Des Moines Register hired a few more reporters, but they're kind of behind a paywall. Uh, conservative media, there's a blog called the Iowa Standard, uh, which does have a lot of daily updates. But also the liberal blogs also do a really good job, again, from their perspective, but I think they do a good job following the news. So uh, Iowa Starting Line is a popular one, and then Bleeding Heartland. Um, they're also kind of you know professional journalists, uh, professional, semi-professional who are covering the state house, and I think give uh, some good analysis of what's actually happening there. Um, but I think that is the challenge, is how do we kind of break down that barrier, make government as accessible as possible, um, make sure that we are reading the bills together because they are complex. I think one of the challenges oftentimes legislation refers to different areas in law. So you kind of have to look up things as you go if you want to figure out what it means. Um, and a lot of it is in the definitions of the words that kind of affect. So lawmaking, as I've learned, um, is a very delicate kind of process where the structure of a sentence could impact the application of the law and its effect on someone's life. And so it's... I want to say, I, you know, I don't want to be naive, but sometimes it is a beautiful process where the people really get involved um, and and help with the legislative proposal. And I will say one of the things that I did uh, prior to getting this job, would I'd visit the state house, you know, I'd find a couple of bills I was interested in. I would draft a minute or two uh, speech or remarks to give it a subcommittee meeting and I would testify at a subcommittee meeting. Um, I think on whatever topic that I was interested in that year, I tried to make a trip once at once a legislative session to find a topic just so I could kind of be in the room, physically be a part of the discussion. Um, and I think a lot of other legislators did that as well prior to getting their legislative position. So my friend Brooke Bowden, who's my boss on the oversight committee, she her legislative project was working on Lyme, Lyme disease and uh, the various kind of medical standards of practice of care. And it was a challenge at times. And I think it was a multiple year project. But uh, she was involved as a grassroots activist on something that's very personal to her because she was affected by Lyme disease. And then, boom, what do you know? That qualifies you. Uh, to now run the government oversight committee. So the people who get involved and, and you know find their way to make sure they're expressing their voice directly, that does tend to graduate you uh, in, into public service. And um, so I definitely encourage people to make it make it uh, make time to come to the state house. If you have is issue in one, or uh, an interest in one of these education policies, uh, please reach out to me and we'll get you there for a subcommittee meeting. I know the um, the anti-factory farm people or the anti-CAFO people, uh, JFAN, I think they're coming up to the State House this Wednesday for their rally day. Um, so find an issue and come to the State House and come tell us in person uh, what's on your mind and then uh, we'll find you a subcommittee meeting and we want to hear your voice. Absolutely. And there's also um, the, the state has a really great website and there's a lot of really great resources there too. So uh, check that out. Um, reach out to Jeff. He's very communicative um, and will respond. What do you think, Steve? Oh no, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's <laughs> the early it's the early going. You know, we're what are we week three? Yeah, yeah we're just starting yeah. week three. Yep. yep. So and it's a beautiful. The capital is beautiful. I don't get fully vested until things hit the funnel. Oh, funnel okay. week. Okay. So I think that'll be uh, first week of March, and so yep. the funnel weekend is when we start narrowing down the policy process. Um, but yeah, the. I, I'm just saying there is a lot of things in front of the state on a lot yep. of different subjects. So we need the public to be involved. Um, the legislative website, legis.iowa.gov, is great, but I still have a hard time keeping up with it. Um, so if you need help <laughs> kind of figuring out the best links to figure out what you're looking for, um, we'd be happy to work on that as well. That is our Chamber Talk here on this Monday. Once again, just a quick reminder, the banquet coming up on April 20th. Now's the time to make your reservations. You can do that at fairfieldiowa.com or email the Chamber at chamber at fairfieldiowa.com. And it's always nice seeing you. Stay tuned. Look at the markets just around the corner with the Brownfield Radio Network.